All right. Good morning, Dallas Chinese Fellowship Church. I thank you for uh, joining us from the comforts of your own home. I'm glad. Hope you're staying warm. Glad that you're safe at home. Um, so would you please uh, just join us from worship where you are? Because remember that the church is is not the building but the body. So please stand and join us as we sing. What is our hope? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days? within his hands what comes apart from his commands and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs sing hallelujah now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death what truth can calm the troubled soul God is good God is good where is his grace and goodness known in our great redeemer's blood who holds our faith when fears arise who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh on to shore the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him. There we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore, oh, sing hallelujah, our hope. our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life. Christ our hope in life and death. Dear Heavenly Father, 
I pray that that is a that is a true song that we sing. That that you are our hope in life and death. And God, I pray that that we look forward to the day where we can worship you um, without any sin or shame holding us back. And till we get to that day, Lord, I pray that we would uh, just cling on to Christ, cling on to what He has done for us, and know that that it is sufficient. So God, give us faith to make it through. Um, yeah, just our lives here on earth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, so this week, um, it's kind of just been a crazy week um, with everything going on. Politically, that's always on the rocks. With the weather, that's, yeah, below zero sometimes and very cold. And, you know, things like the accident in Fort Worth. And uh, sometimes it, it just feels like we get into this funk where it's like, all the cards are stacked against us, and um, we ask, like, does, does God really care? But I was having a conversation um, with a friend who was also having a hard time this week, and he just reminded me of the, the truth that God feeds the sparrow and, and how um, that everything that we have, we have for a reason, and everything we go through, we go, go through for a reason. And so this week, if you've been having a hard time or just this season of life, um, I just want to remind you, encourage you with this next song that that God clothes the lily, God feeds the sparrow, um, and and He cares much more about about you. And so, there is a love. That's already given There is a grace That I could not earn You pour out mercy Morning by morning Your goodness follows Me all of my days What do I have that hasn't been given what do I need that you won't supply you clothe the lily you feed the sparrow they do not worry so neither will I you are faithful already given there is a grace that I could not earn you pour out mercy morning by morning your goodness follows me all of my days what do I have that hasn't been given what do I need that you won't supply you clothe the lily you feed the sparrow and they do not worry so neither will I what do I have that hasn't been given that you won't supply you clothe the lily you feed the sparrow they do not worry so neither will I you are faithful God I will trust you faithful God I will trust you so what do I have that hasn't been given what do I need that you won't supply you clothe the lily 
You feed the sparrow, they do not worry, so neither will I. You are faithful, God. All right, our scripture reading this week comes from Romans 1, 18 through 23, and it is this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world uh, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Uh, For (laughs) although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The Lord 
Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you indeed are holy, you are holy, and you are holy. And we are not. We fall so short of your holiness. We are helpless. And we are sinful. And as we uh, sit at our warm homes, we realize how frail we are. uh, That we're not even as tough as the birds that are outside and the animals that... I can withstand the cold, but we require shelter and clothing. And in this fragility, it reminds us uh, that we need you, and we are dependent upon you and upon your mercy. And so we ask for your mercy. We ask that you grant mercy to this world that is chaotic. Uh, We see tragedies all around us as... Uh, We witnessed um, the accidents that happened in Fort Worth. And so we pray for those uh, families that you would be merciful to them, that you would comfort them as they grieve the loss of their loved ones. And this morning as we listen to your word, may you open up our hearts and our ears and get rid of all the distractions that's going on in our homes, perhaps a stove that's, that's on or uh, the, the drink of water that we need to get. To help us to, to revere your word and to get, allow enough time for it to penetrate our hearts. And so we pray all this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, you guys are at home. It, it's Probably very comfortable. It's very warm out there. And we do praise God for his blessings and his mercy in our lives. And happy Valentine's Day. Today uh, is a day where we get to celebrate perhaps with a loved one or with just friends. The fact that there are friendships and that there is love in this world. And also, let's not forget, happy Chinese New Year's, Lunar New Year. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, celebrated that with, uh, with a few people, probably not too many, um, as I did with uh, my family. We, we ate dumplings, and uh, we even incorporated this Malaysian dish uh, with sushi and grapefruit and all sorts of colorful things. So we were very thankful for that. You know, this morning I wanted you guys to go on an imaginary tour with me, okay? You're at home, right? You're under your blankets, but just imagine if you were just to leave your home for a day, uh, maybe a week, and that week turns into months, and then years and decades, And what would happen to your house? Just imagine that all the electricity would be turned off. There would be no air conditioning or heater. 
what would happen? Of course, you would see spider webs accumulate, dust settle all over the surfaces, and the extreme cold weather, and also the extreme warm temperatures of Texas would eventually cause all the walls to start cracking, perhaps without watering the foundation, you see the foundation start to crack and crumble. As the humidity comes in, as the dryness comes in, the wood will start to warp. Pipes would perhaps burst or get clogged up. And not to mention that your lawn will probably look absolutely crazy. Criminals might start settling in into your house and doing all sorts of things that are unmentionable. Your house will be declared abandoned by the authorities. And maybe it will look like that in a few decades. Let's go on a, another tour. Don't actually do this, but just imagine if you had young kids, little toddlers at home, that you would to leave them. Okay, uh, my guess is that within minutes, within seconds, they would raid the kitchen, they would spill milk around and even burn themselves, flood the house, and maybe even kill each other. And by the time you came home, you think that your house was invaded by criminals. And maybe your house would look like this. Let's go on a, another imaginary tour. Just imagine that you have teenagers. Maybe you are a teenager. And your parents said, okay, hey, if you don't want me to be involved in your life, that's fine. I'm just going to leave you alone at home. And you, of course, you would celebrate, right? You would binge watch Netflix until you're sick of it. You would eat all sorts of junk food, order pizza, hamburgers. You probably stop brushing your teeth, stop taking showers. Maybe you throw a party. Maybe your teenager would get into alcohol, narcotics. They wouldn't set any boundaries in their sexual life. Eventually they would become unhealthy, lazy, addicted to substances, to pornography, to sex. There could be emotional trauma and even possible death. In essence, it would be like a living hell. Sorry to ask you to go through this imaginary tour this morning. You're thinking, man, this is New Year's, all right? This is Valentine's Day. But today's topic is actually the wrath of God. Did you know that God is pouring out his wrath? God is pouring out his wrath. Romans 1.18, we just read it, says this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You know, when we think of the wrath of God, we think of the earth opening up, right? We think of fire and brimstone, Sodom and Gomorrah, fire raining down from the sky, where God judges the wicked people of the earth. But did you know that the wrath of God has many forms? Uh, pastor and author John MacArthur describes five ways that God inflicts wrath. There's the cataclysmic wrath. And, and, and that's where there are God uses natural disasters like the flood to judge people. And then there's the eschatological wrath, where, where God is going to judge the world when Jesus comes back at the end. 
And then there's the eternal wrath. And this is the wrath where those who don't know Jesus Christ will be eternally separated from him and sent to hell eternally, forever and ever. And then there's a fourth kind of wrath, the consequential wrath. This results from bad choices. We reap what we sow. Uh, if we cheat and we lie, we're caught and we're punished. If we eat unhealthy food, we get heart attacks. That's the consequential wrath. And then there's a fifth kind of wrath, and it's called the wrath of abandonment. The wrath of abandonment. This is when God judges the world where he lifts his hand of protection on individuals, on groups, and even nations. God essentially says, hey, you want it your way? Then have it your way. Romans 1, 24 describes this kind of wrath. And it says this, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies, among themselves. God gave them up. Psalm 81 verse 12 puts it this way. It says this, God is saying, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. This giving over, this handing over is the wrath of abandonment. If this is what you want, God is saying, then this is where you're going to get. Uh, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, I, I, thought, I thought God God is a God of love, isn't he? Right? Uh, and then maybe the, the Old Testament talked about his wrath, but, but the New Testament too? Yes, the New Testament talks about God's wrath. I mean, isn't God this, this, this old grandpa, right? This lovely grandpa that's always there to take care of us. Why are we talking about his wrath? If we read the Bible, it talks about his wrath. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, is about his wrath. I know that some of you in the college group are, are reading through the New Testament. That's awesome. And no doubt you will see that God's wrath is in the Bible. God is love, no doubt, but he is also wrath. This wrath, though, is not some kind of out-of-control type of anger. Uh, the Greek word uh, for anger, there's at least two words, thumos, an org. Thumos is where we get the Greek, uh, the English word thermostat, right? Thumos is where there's a sudden rise in temperature, an outburst of passion, an outburst of anger. This is what the Pharisees felt like when they saw Jesus, when Jesus performed miracles, when Jesus preached, they were angry. That's the Greek word thumos. But the Greek word here in the book of Romans for wrath is a, book, is a word org. Org is a controlled type of anger. It's a strong indignation against sin. That's the kind of wrath that we're talking about. And you're thinking, man, I was hoping this morning, you know, since it's cold outside, to be encouraged by the, by the message. The message of Christianity is good news. But good news is not good news unless there is bad news. A coin is not authentic unless it has two sides. Christianity has one side, good news, but the other side is bad news. And last week, we previewed 
the good news. So if this is the only sermon you listen to, you, you got to listen to more sermons. It's always really sobering, though, to see how relevant the scriptures are. I think the more I read it, the more real it gets. Because I, see the, I look at the world around me, and it's not all flowers and sunshine, but there is wrath. There is a sense that God has abandoned certain individuals, groups, nations. God abandons sinners to live the life that they want. And the way he does that is he turns them over to sin. They want freedom, right? We want freedom, and God says, okay, be free. And we turn on the TV, we look at the internet, and we see sin and immorality all around us. There's the sexual freedom. There's lying politicians. There's bribery. There's scandals. Unfortunately, there's pedophilia, child abuse, pornography, spousal abuse, There's murder, mass murders, mass shootings. There's riots and there's wars. And as we, in our society, exercise sexual freedom, marriage becomes an inconvenience. Families become a burden. Children are not valued as being precious. And then as we'll see in subsequent messages... We as a society begin to redefine things that we thought were elementary, like gender and what is a human being. We see wrath all around us. And the question that comes up is why? Why is God pouring out his wrath on us? Why is God pouring out his wrath? What what do we do to deserve this? I mean, look at the people around us. Look at your family members. Look at your roommates and your friends and, and your neighbors and your coworkers and your classmates. I mean, they're good people, right? My coworkers are nice. I don't want wrath on them. Why is God pouring out his wrath? To answer this question, we're going to look at Romans 1. And we're going to focus on verses 18 to 23. After Paul gave us some introductory statements on the book of Romans chapter 1, Paul introduced the theme of his letter in verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 to 17 said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek. The gospel message, the good news, is the theme of the book of Romans. And then he continued in verse 17, he says this, For in it, in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. But now, in verse 18 of Romans 1, Paul transitions from from the righteousness of God to the wrath of God. Uh, And we're going to see that later, actually, he'll pick up The righteousness of God in chapter 3, verse 21. But between verse 18 of chapter 1 to verse 20 of chapter 3, Paul is going to talk about the wrath of God and the pervasiveness of human sin. And so let's go ahead and look at this little outline that we have. Uh, from verses 18 to 32, he's going to talk about, Paul's going to talk about the condition of the Gentile world. And then from chapter 2 to 
chapter 3, verse 8, Paul is going to talk about the condition of the Jewish world. And he's going to conclude that regardless if we're Gentiles, regardless if we're Jews, we are all under sin. Grandma, little baby, regardless of group or ethnicity, we're all under sin. So why is God pouring out his wrath on us? And it is this. God is pouring out his wrath on us because people have suppressed the truth. God is pouring out his wrath on us because people have suppressed the truth. Romans 1 Verse 18 says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God is revealing. This is the present tense, which means that God is in the process. He is continually revealing his wrath. Wrath didn't already happen. It's happening. It's happening as I speak to you. It happened yesterday and is continuing to happen. The wrath of God is being revealed. It is revealed against all ungodliness and all the unrighteousness. People suppress the truth by their unrighteousness and wickedness. What, what does it mean to suppress the truth? To suppress the truth is to tell truth to, to shut up. It's to put a cover on truth. Uh, truth, by the way, it's not just an idea. It's not just a thought. Truth is what we believe. Truth is, needs to be in our minds. And most importantly, truth is actually lived out. Truth is obeyed. But we as a society and as individuals, we have suppressed the truth. We not only deny it, but we don't live it out. It's not enough just to know the truth, but we must live it out. It's not enough for me to stand up here and preach the truth, I have to live it out. It's not enough for you at home to listen to the truth, but we need to live it out. Every week, it seems, we read about another famous Christian leader who has fallen. Just this week, I read about a, a Christian leader, a very famous Christian leader, and he was involved in the suppression of truth. Because this person, even though he spoke truth, he was not living truth. He was abusing women. He was engaging in vile activities that make me uncomfortable even to say it. And much more uncomfortable for you to listen to it. And all the while, he had this appearance and this facade of a godly lifestyle. And now the truth is out. It's no longer suppressed. Before we get on our high horses, though, we think, man, such horrible behavior are all are, are above us. Me? I, I, I don't suppress the truth. Right? But how many of us have hidden things from other people? Right? It starts off kind of semi-innocent, right? We sneak our favorite food around the corner and we eat them. Right? We do that as kids, and we put that cookie in our mouth. Mm, what are you eating? Mm, mm, nothing. And later on, it turns into fantasies in our minds that no one knows what we're thinking. And then we start to look at stuff on our phones, on our computers that we're not supposed to look at. They are not God-honoring. We hide we suppress the truth. And ultimately, though, 
we suppress the truth about who God is. Verse 19 continues. It says this. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. God has shown himself plainly, you might ask. Really? Yes. Verse 20 says this. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. God made everything. He made the mountains. He made the animals. He made the sky. He made the rivers. He made the small creature, the large creature. He made the sun and the moon. And he made the galaxies with hundreds and hundreds of millions of stars. And when we examine those things, it shows God's eternal power. I'm always in, in, in awe of, of creation. I often tell my kids, look, look at the sky. Look at the beautiful painting that God has painted. Look at the colors, the red and the blue and the white. In addition God to God painting the sky, he made nature as if it were poetry. There's order, there's rhyme, there's artistry, there's feeling that's invoked when you look at a beautiful picture of a mountain, and even more when you look at the real mountain. Because creation has meaning. Some people might say, oh, well, all of that was accidental, right? You know, what really made all the mountains it was the wind and the earthquake and erosion. That's what made mountains. One author said this, wind might create a letter in the sand, but not a poem. You see, God engineered, God wrote, he crafted, and he painted the world. Just like you and I would engineer a car. We would build and craft a house, and we would write a book. No one in their right mind would look at all the books that are sold on Amazon.com and say, oh, that just happened by accident. The wind blew, and there it was. And it's absolutely insane that so-called smart and intelligent people say this. And that's why Paul says they are without excuse. Verse 21 continues. Look at it with me. It says this. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. I mean, there is a sense that people don't know God, right? The Bible makes that clear that people don't know God in such a way where they are saved. They don't know him personally. They might have heard about him, but they don't know him relationally. But here in Romans 121, Paul is saying that there are plenty of evidence to show the truth of God's existence, about his power, his eternality. But despite all the evidence around us, people suppress and hide the truth. Despite seeing the intricacies of a snowflake and how each snowflake is unique, people say, "Ah, that was all accidental. So people suppress the truth. And ultimately, they don't honor him or they don't give him thanks. In other words, people fail to glorify God. And here, and that is the root of sin. 
Sin is failure to give God the supreme value, the supreme worth that he deserves. In other words, he is not honored. He doesn't get credit. He's not acknowledged. He's not given thanks for all the blessings that he has given us. It's kind of like a kid saying to his dad when he grow, after he grows up, like, I, I don't know who you are. You didn't, never did anything for me. It's painful. It's dishonoring to parents. And it's painful and it's dishonoring to God when we do that to him. The result or the consequence is this. It continues. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became futile in their thinking. Have you ever uh, talked to people that you just couldn't reason with? I mean, you tried this angle, you tried that angle, they just don't get it. Right? Futile means to be worthless, empty. It's an empty type of thinking. Another translation renders this word as foolishness or nonsense. Right? Oh, these people might have really high IQs. Oh, they may have even really high degrees in their, uni- in their universities or high government positions or institutions. But their thinking is futile. Have you ever noticed how many movies have these two themes, right? Mainly these two themes. It's about the end of the world and it's about aliens, And some movies have both. Okay, so you got the Avengers, okay? If you really think about it, the Avengers is about the end of the world, and it's also about aliens. Okay, Thor and Thanos, they're aliens. Captain Marvel, she's an alien. It seems like our world is obsessed with aliens. One of the smartest men alive in evolutionary biologist of our time, Richard Dawkins, when he was asked, how did the world start? He said, well, I actually don't really know, but I think that there was a higher form of intelligence that seeded life on earth. Did you catch that? He's saying that there's a higher form of intelligence that seeded life on earth and he's not gonna he didn't say that it's god in other words how did life start on earth according to richard dawkins aliens which begs the question well who who made the aliens right this is futility this is emptiness this is foolishness these so-called intelligent people come up with. And the result of futile thinking are darkened hearts. It follow, futile thinking follow, is followed by a darkened heart. A darkened heart is when we lose our sense of morality, when there is moral depravity, where our sense of good and bad, of right and wrong, of good and evil, is distorted, and it's not in accordance to God's standard. So God is pouring out his wrath on us, and the first answer is this, because we have suppressed the truth. And then the second and last reason is this, God is pouring out his wrath on us because people have exchanged the God for goods. People made this exchange. I'll take goods and I'll give up God. The verse, uh, Romans 1, verse 22 and 23 said this, claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man 
and birds and animals and creeping things. They exchange the glory of the immortal God for mortal things, for mortal images. It's a complete insult against God, exchanging his glory for pitiful things. I love how Eugene Peterson renders and translates, paraphrases uh, this verse in in the message. He says this, They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines that you can buy at any roadside stand. Okay, this is called idolatry. Idolatry is when we worship anything else That's not God. When we exchange God for goods, we exchange the creator for the creature. It's plain and simple. Uh, Back in the time where Paul wrote this letter, uh, Romans, the, the Romans, their households would have household gods all over the place. The, ancient, the people in the ancient Near East would also have images of beasts and of animals that they worshipped. Some creatures were half human, half animal. And our, my last trip to Taiwan, we would go visit uh, places and there would be temples that would have images of dragons and all sorts of different things. And people would bow down to them. Growing up, my parents used to keep uh, one of those um, uh, fat Buddhas in, uh, in our restaurant, right? Um, I thought, I mean, I, I thought Buddha was supposed to be skinny, but this, this Buddha was, he was up there. He was obese. And uh, after our family became Christian, you know, we still had this little Buddha tucked in into a cabinet. And finally I just took it out and smashed it and threw it away. You know, most of us in the Western society, we don't worship little statues or big statues, right? But we also have, to some degree, exchanged God for goods. God is the maker. He is the giver of goods. But instead, we have chosen to give up the maker for what he has made. Let me try to put it in terms that we can understand. Let's just say that you and I were offered the the newest car. And this car did not need any maintenance. You didn't need to put any gasoline or charge it up. It never breaks It always looks brand new. It's even better than Tesla's. Or whatever brand you may like. So we were offered this brand new car, but instead we choose a little Hot Wheel replica of that new car. And this Hot Wheel is not even made of metal, not even of plastic. It's made out of paper that perishes. It doesn't even last a day. And you're thinking, that sounds crazy. That's absurd. Exactly. That's what we have done, is we have exchanged God for goods. And it happens because we fail to see the worth and the beauty of God, the Creator. And this is why, my friends, God is pouring out his wrath on us. You might ask, well, is there a way forward? Is there a way out? I mean, I hate for the message just to end right now, right? Right? Is there a way out? And the answer is yes. But first, I think we need to see our depravity. We need to see the depravity of people 
And we need to acknowledge that our ways are evil. The ways of the world is evil and ungodly so that we can embrace the good news that God offers. And what is this good news? This, the good news is this, that God had son, sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life, but he took the punishment that we deserve. He t- took the wrath of God who was meant to be directed on us, and he took that on himself by dying on the cross like a criminal. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, three days later, rose from the dead. He wasn't shackled by death. He wasn't shackled by sin. And he rose from the grave, and he was resurrected. But as a result, the wrath of God was satisfied. At the same time, the good news is given to us and presented to us. Now, it's not enough for us just to hear this good news and to study this good news, but we must receive it personally. We must trust in Jesus Christ. We must truly believe, and to truly believe means that we need to turn away from our old way of thinking and turn forward to a new way of thinking and to a new way of life and follow Jesus Christ. If you already believe That's good. But my question is, do you believe the word of God? You see, this good news is not just here so that we believe what we want and throw out what we don't want. We need to believe the entire gospel. And the next few weeks may prove challenging to some of you because the things that are written in the Bible go against everything that our society values. And because of that, some of you might choose to turn away from God's word. You cannot cancel out sentences in the Bible that you don't like. I cannot do that. I wish we could take a Sharpie and just cross out verses in God's word that we don't like. God is pouring out his wrath on us because people have suppressed the truth and people have exchanged God for goods. So, Let's do the opposite. Let's not suppress the truth. Let's acknowledge God. And even better, let's value God above everything, even if people call us crazy or foolish. Let me end this message with with this. Have y'all heard of the U.S. Secretary of State, William Seward? William Seward was known uh, for orchestrating this purchase, okay? He purchased the state of Alaska for $7.2 million, okay? Um, That's not a whole lot of money in today's day. Actually, even if you account for inflation, it's about $132 million or 37 cents per acre, okay? And people called him a fool, okay? He was known, the whole purchase was known as Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox because who would buy this place that was just filled with ice? It had no potential. But who's the fool now? Okay, Alaska has yielded just in natural resources thousands and thousands of times more than what the U.S. paid for that state. 
even though people called him a fool, Seward knew the value of that icebox. He knew the value of Alaska. In the same way, brothers and sisters, we need to know the value of God so that we may not suppress the truth and so that we may worship and glorify him above all else. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we're in our homes this morning, uh, I pray that we would find it sobering to know that your wrath is being revealed as we speak. And it is the grace of God that that keeps us from uh, stumbling, from falling. Help us to not ignore him as he tugs on our hearts. Help us not to wish that we would go our own way. But let us pray that God would continue to guide us and to shield us and to protect us. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge who he is, but also to live in a way that's consistent with who he is. Help us not to be, be an idolater where we exchange goods for God and help us to value him above all else. And so we pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Patrick, thank you for that word. And I know at times I'm crippled by my own disobedience and I look at um, the nature of my life um, and I'm just thinking to myself that, man, I, I'm not perfect. I can't ever follow God the way he calls us to in, in his word. And, and I think about, yeah, the, the wrath that, um, that Patrick preached about and um, however, uh, as Christians believing in God's word, we know that, that the wrath of God was satisfied in Christ. Um, the same God who has this overwhelming wrath and power is the same God who bore it for you and me. And so rather than trying to constantly prove in our works, in our actions, that we are good enough, we find hope in the one who is good enough and that is Jesus. And so would you please uh, join me in this last um, response song? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. As Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. There in the ground, his body lay of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glory.
glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood So, God, I pray that in my life and in our life here at DCFC, God, that we would not replace uh, you for goods. And, in fact, may we hold the goods that you give us loosely, Lord. And so, God, I pray that if it's our time, if it's our money, if it's our homes, if it's um, our friendships, Lord, that we would use all these things that you have given us for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hopefully you guys are at home, staying warm and cozy. Uh, let's talk about some of the announcements today. And you guys at home, you can just get out your phone and you can look at this QR code and you can uh, point your camera to it and you can pull our bulletin. So go ahead and, and take uh, a few seconds and pull out that phone and click on it. Uh, you can also go to our website and find our bulletin. So go to english.dcfc.org. Uh, Let's go ahead and go there. So it's going to look like this as you pull up our website. Let's go to the next slide. And, uh, and you're going to find there the Sunday bulletin right there on the second column. And you click and it'll go to the Sunday bulletin. Um, there's two things I want to highlight in our bulletin. And first is our elder selection uh, process. So in light of our new vision and also just to provide uh, uh, for the practical needs of our church, uh, our elder board has decided to, uh, to go through the process of electing new elders. And the way we can do that is you can go to our, our website and you can click on uh, the elder selection uh, nomination submission form. And those who are members and those who, who qualify to be elders, they're biblically qualified, can be nominated. And you need to gather about uh, over 20 signatures in order to nominate that person. And they'll go through a, a process of election that's detailed in our bulletin in order to be nominated and eventually voted upon. Our, the second thing we want to announce is that our Chinese service is reopening next Sunday. Uh, so please be praying for, for the safe reopening, that there will be no more ice storms happening next week Okay, as we uh, open Chinese service. And you can refer to the other announcements uh, in, in our bulletin, as the emails were sent out, all in-person um, ministries this Sunday has been moved online or perhaps even canceled. So check with your ministry leaders for specifics. If you would bow your heads with me and receive the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And as you reflect upon the message, after a little while, you're sent out.